Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar about remote UI with Qt for automation on ARM-based edge devices. My name is Stefan Eichenberger and I'm a field application engineer here at Toradex. With me today is Michel Rossi, he is product manager for automation at the Qt company and Johan Lopez, who is senior software engineer also at the Qt company. First, some organizational stuff. At the end, we will do a question and answer session. Um, feel free to enter the questions already during the webinar. Um, this webinar will be recorded and will be made available publicly in around one week. Let me first briefly introduce Toradex. Toradex is a system on module provider that is focusing on high reliability and long-term maintenance. All our products come with a production-ready software installed and the PSPs are Yocto-based. We also provide a huge ecosystem with a lot of articles on our developers page as well as a huge um, partners network where Qt is our preferred partner for user interfaces. Toradex was founded in 2003. We have more than 3,000 active customers and today more than 100 employees in nine global offices. And as I already said, we have a lot of proven partners like Qt. Toradex has a global presence. That means for you, we can do direct sales and direct support in the country next to you. You can find Toradex products in various applications like um, communication, uh, medical and healthcare, and industrial automation where we target this webinar today. Toradex offers two product families. One is the Apalis family, which has high-speed interfaces like PCI Express and SATA or USB 3 and the Colibri family who is focusing more on a good price uh, performance ratio. All modules within one family are pin compatible. So that's already it from my side. I would now like to hand over to Michel from Qt and he will talk a little bit about what uh, Qt can offer for uh, in the automation field. Thank you very much, Stefan. Hello, everybody. My name is Michele Rossi. I'm a product manager for automation industry at Qt Company. Uh, before to start with my presentation, I will kindly remind a webinar that we were running with Toradex. So if you missed that, uh, my invitation is to go online and have a look uh, on our previous webinar where we were talking about getting started with Qt on Toradex in no time. So now a quick introduction about uh, Qt and uh, the Qt company. Qt as software product is available in the market since a long time. We are talking about more than 20 here in the market. And uh, today the main contributor into the Qt framework uh, uh, it's the Qt company. Today the Qt company has a worldwide coverage. We are more than uh, 300 people already and uh, we can support you in a worldwide scale covering more than 70 industry and supporting more than 5,000 customers worldwide. What is Qt? Qt is a software development framework that allows you to uh, code once and deploy everywhere. So our value proposition is shorten the time to market for device manufacturing company and uh, software developer in order to easily create a C++ or Python application using Qt. Today Qt is available with the 5.11 release. And as you can see here, uh, the value of Qt is, of course, cross-platform capability. It means that uh, you can run Qt on desktop, embedded, mobile, and today we are going to have a look also web space. As I was saying before, Qt uh, is focusing in, this, in different industries, and one of these industries is uh, industrial and infrastructure automation. So, um, 
as product manager in automation, I'm really looking forward to understand the, custom, the, the market needs and provide more value on industry-specific requirement on top of the Qt framework. Some use cases uh, uh, we can see in, this, in the picture are like uh, industrial touch panel. Uh, all the devices that they, they fit into building automation or smart cities, uh, SCAD application or desktop application within the automation field, endless devices into factory automation or process automation or smart cities, they will require to have a remote UI in order to access to the application and uh, everything that is uh, a new trend in the market like uh, robot, uh, collaborative robot, uh, edge, edge computing and edge devices. Where we are focusing uh, with Qt in automation is at edge level. We try to provide more value into Qt specific for the needs of that market. In this case, where we are focusing is on the connectivity level both on the field side and to the cloud side in order to enhance even more industrial IoT application. Another item that we are looking into is providing you more tooling and developer experience approach. And of course, what we are also looking into is enabling new use cases into automation granting new feature like remote UI on the browser. Also, what we are looking into is providing you more reliability and uh, more support. We know that in automation industry, long-term support is really important for all software application. And another item we are looking into is providing you more feature for advanced UI, like 3D, for example. So now I'm going through specific item that I want to mention about connectivity aspect. The first item that I want to mention is Qt Serial Bus. It's a module into Qt that allow you to use two specific protocol. One is CAN bus and the other one is Modbus. Modbus is a well spread protocol into automation market and allow you to create use cases like server application or client application using Qt Serial Bus module. Another protocol I want to mention included into Qt is Qt MQTT. I don't know if you are familiar with MQTT, but just to mention Qt MQTT is a lightweight, reliable and secure protocol that simplifies the connectivity for industrial IoT application. In this case, where we are focusing is on the client part, enabling publisher subscriber application. We don't cover the broker. Today, in 5.11, we support protocol level three and level four. And for the next release, 5.12, we are looking into to provide also level five support on this protocol. Another protocol spreadly use into building automation market is KNX. And uh, with Qt KNX module, we support the client uh, net IP implementation of this protocol in order to allow you to create use cases like uh, supervisor touch panel in order to retrieve and send information into the KNX protocol. Another important thing that I want to mention is OPC UA. We strongly believe that into factory automation, OPC UA will be more and more used in the future. That's why we are investing a lot, providing support for this protocol. And in the way we are providing support is wrapping available backend in the market like Open 62541, it is open source backend, and unified automation that is provided commercially by company today in the market. We are looking into today providing you wrapper for client part, but also in the future we are looking into providing support for the server part of OPC UA. Just briefly to mention other item, we are focusing even more on the tooling part, like a specific feature for Qt Design Studio. Qt Design Studio is a tool 
that enhance the workflow between designer and developer and uh, providing more integration tooling for Qt Creator and Boot Qt, Qt 3D Studio and all other tooling that you can think to use in Qt. So that was my part. Now I would like to hand over to Johan that is going to explain you a little bit more what we are doing into remote UI space uh, with all the features that we are going to support. Hello everyone. Uh, yes, so I'm gonna talk about specifically two uh, new features that we've uh, added in the, the recent versions of Qt. Qt WebGL and Qt for WebAssembly. So let's start with uh, Qt WebGL. Uh, so what, what that is? Uh, Qt WebGL is a new graphics backend for a Qt application. And the use case is for uh, sharing um, basically a Qt application to a web browser. And uh, the way it actually works is that you're going to have your, your normal, regular Qt application running, in our case, on an, an embedded device. And instead of rendering this application on, on the local screen attached to that board, it will instead stream all the rendering command to a distant browser. So technically there is, uh, when you start the application in that mode, there will be a small HTTP server running. And when you connect from the browser, it will just open up in a, a WebSocket channel, which will be used by the remote device to stream all these WebGL commands and being rendered in the browser. So, and the other way around, of course, all input, which is uh, entered into the browser, like uh, mouse clicks or, or keyboards, are forwarded to the remote device. And this can work uh, on any modern web browser, uh, like Chrome, like Firefox, uh, like Microsoft uh, browsers. And uh, there, this will be, uh, it, it was available as a matter of fact already, as I said earlier, in since 5.10 and 5.11, but as technology preview. So in 5.12, we will introduce the initial release, the final release of this module. But there are some uh, limitations in 5.12 that will be worked on in future versions, and these are that initially it is only one user connecting at a time. Also only one screen, meaning that you can only have the same instance of the application running remotely or locally, so only one screen at a time. And also it is only for Qt quick application, so with the, the QML language and not for widget application. So how do you actually get started with this and how can you try it yourself? Uh, if you go to the, the official Qt documentation, if you search for Qt Quick WebGL, then you will find some very simple instructions. Basically, you do, you do not need to use any specific API or build your application in a very specific way. It's really just about uh, providing an argument to the, the application that you execute that you can see here in the, in the middle of the screen. So you just pass a dash platform WebGL, and that's all you need to do to enable this remote uh, uh, control via WebGL. So uh, I, I did talk a bit about one possible use case, which is basically, and which is also due to one of the limitation, it's basically for headless device. You just have a device running somewhere, uh, which is not attached to any screen, and you want to be able to control it and maybe monitor something which is running there and executing the, in, the UI, again, running there. But it opens up to some other use case, like mirroring. However, since I did say that you can only have one or the other, it requires to put in place a, a specific architecture. And now uh, Stefan will show you a demo uh, of, of such a use case, basically mirroring both the local screen and 
and seeing that in the web browser. Okay, thanks a lot, Jan. Yeah. Um, so what you will see in the following video is um, it's basically a Colibri IMX7 that reads some data from some sensors and will display them on a display. So, so that is what you see now. Um, there are some gyroscope, magnetometers, and the power sensor. And additionally, we now have the possibility to mirror this screen to a web browser that supports WebGL. So this is Chrome running. And you can see now the same user interface in the browser. There is, of course, a little bit of latency, but as soon as it is loaded, um, it works quite well. And it is mirrored in both ways, so you can see the same screen and the, the inputs from the browser on the, the display and vice versa. And there is also a, a reconnection feature. So if the connection is for some reason lost here because the device is going to stand by, it will automatically recover after a while. But it takes some time, therefore I've speeded up the video a little bit. Um, but that is faster if you use, for example, Ethernet. This is, the Wi-Fi has a little bit long to, to do the reconnection. The same thing also works on mobile devices like a smartphone. Um, yeah. I'm not really experienced with QML, so I did this demo, but I wasn't experienced with QML before. Um, you have to write the application in QML, and so I had to learn that, but after that it was quite straightforward to implement the QTV WebGL feature, and uh, it was very easy to implement the remote UI stuff. Um, there is one speciality, so um, the, the QT charts um, stuff has some wiredness, but the QT team was helping me very well, so it was was quite easy to, to add the support for QT charts after that. So that's already the demo. I would now like to hand over back to Johan. Okay, so let's just have a look uh, a bit at the architecture of this demo because, uh, as I said earlier, uh, normally, I mean, if you're just going to try this yourself and run the application, with WebGL, you will see that, again, you can only have it remotely and not at the same time on your device and remotely. So to achieve that, you, you need to, to architecture your application in, in, in the way you, you see it now on screen. And so what, what you need to do is to have two separate process running at the same time. One for the local UI running on the touchscreen and another process uh, running with WebGL. However, uh, again, since the point is to do mirroring, you want to show exactly the same thing. So, of course, you're going to load in each of these processes the exact same QML code. So that, again, it's an exact copy of the, uh, the, the user interface. However, uh, again, you want to show exactly the same thing, not just the same UI, but you want everything to be synchronized. You want uh, the, the same tab to be active, you want the same data being displayed. So for that, you need to somehow synchronize the two process. And how this was done here is that there's actually only one, let's say, backend or business logic. And that is running into the, the main process, the process that is in charge of rendering to the, the touchscreen display. And in this case, it was done in C++. And all the remote access process does is it's connecting to the, the, the backend running in the other process using another module, uh, something which is new in Qt since also 5.12, and that is Qt Remote Object. Uh, it is a very simple API which lets you share a queue object interface across processes or even across device on the network. 
Uh, and basically, it's really you have the, the, the full key object, meaning its properties, its signals, and its slots accessible from the other process. So again, here, only one backend to process loading the same GUI and uh, the remote one, the remote access is connecting to the, the, the backend in the other process. And so that way, when you connect from the browsers to the remote access process, then everything is just kept synchronized between the two uh, process. So now let's move on to the next new feature we've added in five. Uh, actually, this is still a technology preview in five to 12. Uh, but again, it is available and you can try it already now. So this is Kit for WebAssembly. Uh, and you, you might not know what WebAssembly is. It is a standard for executing um, binary code from a browser. And this without any plugin or any third party uh, extension to the browser or anything like that. It is really just like in the end, like a web page that you load, nothing else is required. So uh, how does that actually work? So for, for Qt, it is really just a new platform. So it means there's a tool chain, just like you, we, we provide support for Windows tool chain, uh, Android tool, tool chains and so on. So there's support for a new tool chain that lets you compile your existing Qt application or a new one for the web. And technically what's gonna be done is that uh, it's using, uh, it's converting really all the C++ code uh, to um, JavaScript and then also to some, some really WebAssembly bytecode. And you put all that, all these files, but it actually it's just really one file, which is a WebAssembly file, plus some JavaScript library. This is generated by Qt automatically and the HTML5 page. You put this on a web server, and then really it just behaves like a regular web page. You just connect to the server, it downloads the, the WebAssembly file, WebAssembly package, then the browser compiles that to actual target native code, and then it's being executed 100% on the client. So um, it really is, in the end, uh, a client uh, Qt application, but that doesn't then require any installation of anything besides having a browser. Let's just have a look at a few examples uh, of existing Qt application that have been compiled for WebAssembly. Uh, now I'm just uh, showing you uh, a demo that we called sensor tag running on, on Firefox. And this demo or this example, uh, again, was not done specifically for the web. It was originally a demo for uh, embedded Linux and also for Android and iOS. And what it does, it simply just displays uh, in a cute quick UI uh, values from various and various sensors, basically like temperature and so on. So we really just took that, that application, just recompiled it for WebAssembly and, and that's it. And it just works in exactly the same way. So yeah, I'm sorry if I interrupt you, uh, mm -hmm. we may we may see some lag uh, during your presentation, but this is just <laughs> a feedback uh, related to the lag uh, for within the, yeah, the, web, yeah. the webinar it's, tool. But uh, yeah, exactly. So the, the streaming or the, the bandwidth, uh, uh, or oh, actually not so much about bandwidth, but the, the tool doesn't allow, of course, to get a, a smooth frame rate when streaming and things like this. Uh, but this is actually important and. and um, to actually mention that you can actually get very good performance this way because uh, under the hood, it's actually using OpenGL always, unlike a traditional uh, HTML5 page, simply because it's based on WebGL, all the rendering. So you really get uh, really smooth uh, performance on, on any browser. And let's uh, see, uh, have a look at, uh, at another example. This one, you might have seen it. It's uh, the standard Qt Quick Controls example. And so now running in, in a browser. So yeah, 
basically can use all these things. And unlike WebGL, which allows only to stream Qt Quick UIs uh, with Web Qt for WebAssembly, you can also uh, use. Oh, I just reload it. You can also use widget application. So it, it might not make any sense, but you, you can still do it. So here is again one other uh, standard widget example from the Qt SDK. You can actually try all of these yourself if you go on our blog and you look for Qt for WebAssembly examples, and you will see there are even a few other ones that you can try yourself there from your browser. So now let's go back a bit to the, the, the topic we were discussing, which was specifically remote control of device, because actually WebAssembly is a bit more wide than this. You could imagine a lot of possible use cases from this. But if you want to achieve something similar to what to the video we saw a bit earlier, you could potentially do it as well uh, with WebAssembly. And, and this is what you can see here uh, on the image. Uh, still on the embed de embedded device, you would have a Qt application running, but now it would basically just be the backend. There would be, of course, no UI at all running there. And instead, you would have an embedded HTTP server running on a device that would host the, the Qt application as a WebAssembly file. And from the remote browser, you would just connect to that server uh, and and that's it, really. It would download the application. And since, of course, you would need to exchange some data, then you would need to use web sockets to, to do that. And that leads me to uh, the limitations, basically, of this, of Qt for WebAssembly. Because even though you can you know, compile a C++ application with, uh, you could think that you can just use anything in Qt that way, but it is not the case. Uh, simply because you have the same restrictions as you have in, uh, in an HTML page, meaning that it is a, a sandbox environment. And for security reasons, you cannot, for example, access the file system. You cannot access the full network stack and, and other things. So especially for data exchange, the only thing you can do is to use WebSockets. And uh, well, uh, luckily, you, you can do that directly in Qt because Qt has the Qt WebSocket module. So you can use that from your know, Qt for WebAssembly application to exchange data. And well, this is really just an example of a simple architecture, but you could perfectly have as well uh, the server somewhere else. It doesn't have to be on the device, obviously. Uh, and also you could uh, yeah, have much more complex, of course, architecture. Just a word also that I didn't mention about uh, the WebAssembly, the WebGL, sorry, demo, is that you could also do exactly the same thing with another plugin, which will be reintroduced uh, recently, and that is the Qt for VNC plugin. So again, it's exactly the same uh, potential use case, but instead of streaming to a web browser, you can use a VNC client to display the remote application. But again, if you want to have at the same time or mirror the, the distant display and, and the, or the device display and the browser, or in this case, the VNC client display, you would need to have this two process architecture. So let's sum up with a comparison of the two technology because you it might not be clear i mean what are the differences because in the end they provide a similar feature which is to run a cute application inside a web browser but again there are actually quite uh, important differences and uh, so so let's start let's go through this list uh, so the, the first difference i would say is really about use case the, the web gl streaming case is a is really in the end about either headless device control or monitoring, or as we saw also maybe for mirroring. And I think that's what it's good for. However, for Qt for WebAssembly, I think it's really much wider. 
you could achieve exactly the same thing, like uh, rem just remote controlling uh, a device. But you could even think now about simply writing a web application with Qt potentially. Uh, most likely not only with the full web assembly, but by mixing it with just regular HTML5 code. Uh, but yeah, it, it really opens up a lot of new possibilities. When it comes to, so now a bit back to really the, the remote control use case, uh, what's happening with WebGL in terms of what information is being exchanged between the, the server and the client. So with WebGL, it is really only OpenGL drawing code, which is being shared, no, nothing, really nothing else than that. While with WebAssembly, uh, well, it's even less, uh, it is really just, downloading the WebAssembly file. And of course, after that, there might be more data exchanged, but uh, there's not this constant flow like with WebGL serving up information being uh, requested. For the client, we already said it, it is a browser solution. All these two features are for browsers, and that's the only thing you can use for using it. In terms of quality, uh, both solutions are completely lossless. And uh, I'm saying this because if you compare it to VNC, VSC can be lossy in a sense that since it's actually streaming images, uh, if the, the network uh, or if the connection is not good, you might actually see uh, like an image of a quality which is lower than it should. So it is not the case with WebGL because you actually streaming the commands and everything is being rendered in the browser. After that, when it comes to the load, uh, let's see it that way, like the load which is being put on the server or on the client, it is also quite different. With WebGL, uh, there will be equally uh, processing happening on the server and on the client, because even though the actual rendering is done in the browser, where the, the Qt application still needs to run on the server, which again, in, in what we're talking about, this is the embedded device. Embedded device. Uh, so the Qt application run on the embedded device, it computes all like the, the it creates the scene graph, it, it really decides what should be rendered, and then when it has done that, it just streams all these uh, primitives to the, to the browser, which does the rendering. So you really have processing being done on each side, but as a matter of fact, a uh, slightly bigger load on the server side. While for WebAssembly, it is really all, all happening on the client side, so only in the browser. There's really nothing happening on the server besides just downloading the, the file. When it comes to user, how many user can connect uh, to the remote device with WebGL streaming, we already said it. It is single user only in Qt 5.12, while with WebAssembly, it is really only limited by what the HTTP server can do. So it is, of course, multi-user. In terms of what you can do with it, uh, WebGL streaming, this is only Qt Quick application and no Qt widget. While for with Qt for WebAssembly, you can do any kind of Qt application, so widget and Qt Quick. Something really, uh, the, the next point is something you should uh, really take into account when making a decision between these two technologies. It's about latency. Uh, so with WebGL, I explained it earlier, a lot of information, like there's really this streaming of potentially a lot of information being, being exchanged. And that means that, uh, well, I mean, the, the further away it will be uh, from the server, the more there could be some issues because of latency, uh, especially with input la latency and what you actually see being rendered. While with uh, Qt4 WebAssembly, everything is being executed and rendered uh, on the client. So, of course, uh, there is no latency, at least between input and rendering. There might be with the data exchange, but at least not between input and rendering. Then uh, about what you need actually to, to run a Qt app with each, in the, with each of these uh, solutions on the server side. So for WebGL streaming, uh, actually you don't need anything extra. 
there's an embedded server running inside the Qt application by the WebGL plugin. And, uh, and that's all you can do, really. It's only the server embedded inside the plugin. While with Qt for WebAssembly, you can run uh, any, any HTG server that is on the market. We talked about the UI, what is running where, but what about the backend? The backend? Uh, so with WebGL, this is also always running on the server because you're really just streaming the, the, the UI. So again, everything running on the server. While with WebAssembly, it can be a mix. Uh, it could be everything running on the client. It could be everything running on the server in terms of business logic, or it can be a mix. And finally, uh, also an important point, it's about security. Because again, here we're talking about uh, basically transmitting potential critical information over the network. So um, with WebGL streaming, and again, inside the 12 this will change in the future, there is currently no encryption of the data being exchanged and also no connection level authentication. So you wouldn't to put in place another solution if you need security there. With WebAssembly, no limitation on the server. So uh, basically you can just use a secure HTTP server. And also for exchanging data between the front end and the back end, uh, as I said earlier, you can use Qt WebSocket. And of course you can use that with uh, SSL so that all the data exchange is secure. Before we take the questions, I will uh, hand over again to Michaela to give uh, some extra information. So thank you very much, Johan. Uh, we would like to invite you to have a look uh, on our webinar on 27th of November. Uh, of course, if you are interested to knowing more about Qt4 WebAssembly, we will run a dedicated uh, webinar uh, telling you more about uh, what you can do today with Qt4 WebAssembly. And uh, if you want to give a try to Qt4 Automation, uh, uh, please uh, uh, give a chance to download it uh, from our website. So you just need to Google Qt in Automation. And then uh, if you want to have a look on the feature that we were describing today, uh, just ask for a trial of Qt for automation. And uh, another another item I want to mention to you, it's all the documentation and all the information we are releasing these days. So if you are interested more into connectivity and uh, cloud connection and serialization, you would like to give a try to all the blog posts we were writing for you with our uh, engineers and uh, also more and more information about the tooling part uh, that we were describing before. So if you're interested in knowing more from the technology standpoint of view of which are the solution you can create with Qt, please give a try on our blog post page that you can find in the blog.qt.io. So thank you very much everybody to joining us and now we will be really pleased to answer your question. Thank you very much, Johan and Michel. Um, so we are now in the question and answer session. Uh, we already got some questions. The first one we have is um, someone asks, could you shed some light on the roadmap for WebGL and WebAssembly? Yes, uh, definitely. So uh, related uh, web. GL, uh, as I was, as we were mentioning before, uh, we are looking into a specific topic like uh, adding uh, direct security on top of WebGL, and uh, even more uh, enabling uh, other use cases like uh, multi-client connection. These are topics uh, that are really uh, interesting for us, uh, and uh, we are looking into with our R&D team in order to develop more and more feature and more functionality, and of course. Uh, uh, everything related to performance improvement uh, into WebGL. Related to uh, WebAssembly, uh, today the supported module for WebAssembly are Qt Base, Qt Declarative, uh, Qt Quick Control 2, Qt Chart, uh, Qt WebSocket, and uh, Qt MQTT. What we don't support is Qt Multimedia and uh, Qt Web Engine. But uh, 
uh, from Roma perspective, uh, we are looking into more integration within uh, Qt Creator. So we are planning to have uh, um, a kit uh, target uh, into Qt Creator for WebAssembly. And also uh, what we are looking into is integrating virtual keyboard, uh, shared library build, uh, system clipboard integration. And uh, we are also working uh, uh, into looking for multi-threading support. So this is something we are depending on uh, the browser supporting multi-threading, but of course, uh, uh, as soon as it will be supported, we are also looking into that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then the next question is, are there any limitations for what's available currently on WebAssembly? Yes, so uh, as I was saying before, uh, the supported module within WebAssembly are Qt Base, Qt Declarative, uh, Qt Quick Control 2, Qt Chart, and Qt WebSocket, and Qt MQTT. So today are missing Qt Multimedia and uh, Qt Web Engine. But in this case, we are really uh, looking into and looking forward to have uh, feedback from uh, users. So please uh, reach out to us uh, via blog post or via our direct channel in order to provide more feature related to what you would like to have supported on uh, Qt for WebAssembly. Okay. Um, then I think that's a similar question. So are there um, any QML features that are not supported on Qt WebGL yet, so can we use everything with we know from with QML also with Qt WebGL? Maybe I can answer, or I don't know if you wanted to say something. But uh, basically, in terms of visual elements, there is no really limitation on to what can be used visually again. But of course, when it comes to non-visual items, not everything will be streamed. And I'm thinking, for example, about a specific API, which is uh, the multimedia API. So streaming a video should work, even though you might not get great performance because it's a lot of data to stream uh, and that is not compressed. But the audio, for example, this is what I was thinking about, audio won't be streamed. So if you want to stream a video, there will be only the video part, but not the audio part. But otherwise, for visual items, you can uh, basically use anything. Okay, perfect. And then the next question, is it possible to use Qt WebAssembly for web application development, I think? So really, instead of doing HTML5, using Qt WebAssembly. Uh, so my kindly invite is to have a look on the example you can find online related to Qt for WebAssembly and then uh, you will realize the performance uh, and what you can uh, really do with uh, Qt uh, for WebAssembly. I, I mean, uh, we have an, an example that is called Slate that is running uh, like a sort of paint uh, software into the browser. So it's up to imagination uh, and also uh, up to architectural approach uh, defining what you would like to create with WebAssembly or not. If we can add something on this topic. So, I mean, I would say that yes, actually, uh, because we, we've been focusing on remote now UIs, but um, I did say that WebAssembly has a bit wider, uh, uh, let's say, use cases, wider range of use cases. And I think that, yes, it could be used to do web development instead of HTML5, or more realistically, I think it could be used in combination with traditional, uh, let's say, web tools or web, uh, web technologies. But yes, I think it is definitely a, a possible use case. Especially, I would say, if you want to reuse existing Qt code, so you, you could literally just reuse it for the web version of your application or, or some other services which might need to use some business logic you brought in Qt, or maybe even some UI. Okay, thank you. And then the next question is, uh, that's maybe for both of us, what is Toratex association with Qt? So um, we are not related in, in the means that we have some financial, uh, relationship, but we have a strong partnership, I think, or 
how would you describe that? <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely, <laughs> Stefan. So uh, I, as I was doing, uh, as my first slide is inviting you to have a look on our previous webinar, and it will be explained uh, which is the partnership we are uh, putting in action. Uh, so more uh, integration within uh, Qt uh, for Toradex uh, boards. So it's always a matter of user experience for uh, Toradex and Qt in order to really start uh, quickly using uh, both technology for for you. Exactly. Um, uh, one thing I can also mention for lower quantities, it's also possible to order the light runtime licenses directly by at Toradex. So that's something we can offer. But as I said, we have no really. It's not not that we have a fi financial um, interest in that. It's, it's more to offer our customers a good solution or in one solution. Um, then there is a question, are any APIs required for the setup? So the setup, I think it was meant the uh, WebGL setup. And I think as API, they mean uh, probably it's uh, the WebGL plugin that you have to compile at the moment because it's not far so, Actually, in 5.12, uh, Michele, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the plugin is already integrated uh, I mean, it's, it's provided as binary. Yeah. Uh, well, at least. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's true that before you needed to compile it yourself, but at least in yeah. 512, you can just use it. Yeah, but I think even in the, what I saw in our um, boot to cute image, even with 5.11.3, it was already included as well. But I think it was not official, so it's, I don't know exactly why it was yeah. there. But yeah. I didn't yeah. have to compile it. Yeah, definitely. So we are going to uh, launch uh, Qt for Qt WebGL uh, as official supported in 5.12. So that's why. Okay, perfect. And then someone asks, there was recent a lot of improvements in uh, responsive design for mobile devices for HTML5 frameworks. So are there also strategies from Qt to improve that with WebGL and WebAssembly? to make the UIs more responsive? I mean, what we are looking into is providing the best uh, experience uh, for our developer uh, uh, in terms of uh, fast developer, development and also in the better result and performance. So um, we, we are improving performance in terms of uh, uh, how big will be the, the binary code that will be generated uh, in order to improve uh, that part that is really important and uh, everything that is related to, to performance of course we are looking into to, to provide you all the support. I can add also a comment. Uh, so basically I mean when you compare web technology to, to Qt Quick and now I'm not going to focus on Qt Quick because so if we took, talk about responsive design, uh, Qt Widget definitely is not really doesn't have anything to, to, to achieve, let's say, really responsive design. But Qt Quick, however, uh, I don't know uh, for the person who asked the question how familiar you are with Qt Quick, but uh, really it, it is actually part of technology, actually. It's always been possible to do responsive design and is really the point, as a matter of fact. But you can use, for example, anchor layouts uh, or anchor-based layout to be able to have automatically um, repositioning of items based on the size of the window or the application or also by using uh, loaders in QML to be able to load specific parts of your application only under certain conditions. So really again QML at least not widget but QML is really actually responsive design is built in the technology. Okay yeah thank you. Um, one more question is, uh, which module of Toradex did the demo feature? So that was a Colibri IMX7, um, but it would work, of course, also on different modules. Um, the sources are also available on GitHub, the GitHub Toradex. Um, of course, because it's a special hardware we use, so the, the, the carrier board, um, 
you would have to add or activate the mockup, but there is a mockup available you can activate and then you show some random data. Um, one more question is, does this work in the browser as well when using WebGL? Maybe with WebGL, yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, like, uh, maybe. But, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understood also the question, but basically, uh, actually WebAssembly, when you use Kit for WebAssembly, it is using WebGL internally for actually doing all the rendering because uh, especially at least for Qt Quick or Qt QML UIs, because this is based on OpenGL, and so basically all the OpenGL commands when run on WebAssembly are converted to WebGL, so it's actually using WebGL. But I'm not sure I actually answered the question, but uh, yeah. Okay, so, so it's a follow-up. Uh, there were <laughs> some additional notes now. Um, it was rec related to the other question rec uh, regarding responsive design for mobile devices because I think on the demo we saw that it was kind of, it had a, had a little bit of latency, but I think that's really something that is coming from the, the connection and the, the high data rate as you, you explained in, in your presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe Q, so the WebGL is maybe not much faster. Or, or it's hard to improve the, the latency on the WebGL for, for that use case. Um, one question was the IMX8, will it work on that? Um, yes, of course it will work on, on the IMX8, especially the Apalis that is anyway high performance uh, CPU and it will also work on the Colibri IMX8 in the future but we don't have the demo available for that devices yet. So yeah I think that are all questions um, so let me close now the webinar. Thank you very much for attending and uh, thanks a lot for giving us the information uh, Michel and Yuan. So see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.